Okay, so we are live. We are live today to talk about a one Mr. Wes Craven today. So before I get into that, I do see we have some people in the chat already. I will catch you tomorrow. All right, no worries. I miss Wes Craven. I'm sure you're not alone in that. Absolutely. Um, hey, hippie. Good to see you. Good to see you, Tim. Oh, George. Hey, good to have you. Thank you for the tip. What's up? It's great to be back and talk about one of the best horror directors of all time, Wes Craven. If you could have creative control over one of Craven's films, which do you choose and what changes do you make? Oh my goodness. What a question to get things kicked off. I have I have his filmography pulled up in front of me right here. So I guess I would have to go with one of my one of my least favorites of his. Let's see what that would be. Um and like how would I fix it? I don't know. Actually, I feel like this is just because I like I just watched this movie a couple nights ago, but My Soul to Take was the last movie he directed before Scream 4. And I think it was actually a really, really interesting premise. Essentially, like this this serial killer dies, and then he his the seven parts of his personalities go into seven babies that were born the night of his death. It's a little bit giving child's play vibes, but like way more messed up kind of, but the movie's just really, really messy. It's got a lot of problems. It's, it's very weird. So yeah, I guess I would just try to tighten it up, clean that story up. And yeah, just honestly, just make it coherent. It's really incoherent. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is, what happened with that one. Cause then he went right on to make Scream 4. And there's actually, you can tell there's kind of a lot of influence from my soul to take in Scream 4. They're, they're more similar than I would have imagined them to be. So yeah, it's a really interesting question. See who's here. Jill is here. Good to have you. Looking forward to this. Always your favorite horror director. Good stuff. Good stuff. Greetings. Ryan is here. The Elite Morin is here. Oh, Whiskey Morg. Glad you made it. And Corey, hope everyone's having a happy day. Sending you all epic energies. Absolutely. Paying that good energy forward. Alex is here. Oh, Francisco. <laughs> Long time no see. We just had a meeting about something pretty special this morning. Maybe let me know if I can talk more about that yet, Francisco, but I don't know. The creepy cutie is here. Good to have you. Austin is here. We've got some patrons in the chat. Love to see that. Anthony's here. Anthony just wrote a really good review of Somnum. I really appreciated that, Anthony. So good to have you here. Um, oh, you just finished Curse a little bit ago. I loved Curse so much more than I thought I would. Oh my gosh, I'm excited to talk about it. I love Cursed. My soul to take it, it had a lot of potential. It still does. I think I think if they remade it in another 10 years or so, we could do something real interesting with it. Oh, hey, glad to join a live from the beginning. Yeah, good to have you. Good to have you. And Jason Voorhees, the icon, the legend is in the chat too. <laughs> yeah, and good day. Good sir, good sir. Nathan is here, good to have you. Let's see, how do you think a Wes Craven film would look like in 2022 if he was alive today? Um, it That's really hard to say. But I think that given that Scream 4 was the last one he directed before he passed, I, I think that he obviously would have had a lot of involvement in Scream 5. And I don't I don't feel like Scream 5 is too far off to to the direction that West would have taken it, right? Because it was it was also written by Kevin Williamson. Um, yeah, so I feel like Scream 5 is probably the best example. That's kind of an easy answer though. I don't know. I'd have to think about that more, honestly. But let's see. What else we got here? Oh, Tita's here. Good to have you. Heard my soul to take was kind of wonky. It's absolutely very wonky. It's very weird. Oh, Rob, gonna be popping in and out. Good to have you too. Music of the Heart is underrated. I didn't love that one. I didn't really love that one. Sorry, I just bumped my desk. Um, hi, good to have you, Daniel. And Sebastian is here. All right. Um, let's see. Do oh what? Oh. Oh, Intelligence Cycle is here. I feel like you haven't been here in a long time. Looking forward to discussing Wes Craven, an iconic filmmaker filmography. Absolutely. He's got some crazy movies under his belt. Um, oh, you're seeing Pearl tonight. Oh my gosh. I can't even go to the early showing because my car is in the shop right now. So I'm going to see it tomorrow. But yeah, so my my patrons will be getting my, my first reactions on Pearl. Hopefully tomorrow. Um, if not tomorrow, then definitely Saturday. But yeah, yeah. Oh, glad you liked it. I did. Yeah, thank you. Somnum is <laughs> still amazing. Everyone needs to see it. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I don't know if the, I don't know if it's actually linked below or if I just have the the GoFundMe linked below, but it it's on my channel anyways. You can find it. 
Oh, the first live you've joined. Glad to have you too. Toby, nice to have you here. And Ashton is here. Scream 5 is my favorite horror movie of the year still. Oh my gosh, for me, it's going to be tough. There are actually a handful of movies that I enjoyed more than Scream. I don't know, like when I rank my favorites of the year, depending on entertainment value, I don't know if Scream will be higher than these, but like Watcher, I gave a higher score than Scream. Hatching, I gave a higher score. Prey, I gave a higher score. Um, Barbarian, I gave the same score as Scream 5. But like in terms of entertainment value and my theater experience, Barbarian was my best theater experience of the entire year. I, I wonder how Prey would match up with Barbarian, like, if I'd seen it in a theater, you know, versus at home. But I still gave it a... I mean, it was still incredible, you know? Oh, did I hear the studio and production problems with Cursed? I... No, I've, I've been doing some of my research on Wes Craven. And so, in some of, like, I watched a... It was like a 24 minutes uh, interview or something, which I didn't know that was a thing. I was like, I thought, isn't it called 60 minutes? I guess they have one that's 24 minutes. I watched that. I watched, um, th there was like a master of masters of cinema episode that they did on him. And it was like his whole life and everything. So I just heard little tidbits cause they kind of covered his whole career in those videos. So I'm going to try my best to find maybe like some promotional interviews or something from cursed. Cause that was, you know, just about 10 years ago. So hopefully there are some, but yeah, I heard that it 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 was a mess, and he he didn't seem too too proud of the the movie when he was talking about it, because he did. I I found I did find one interview that was from like 2010, I think, when he was promoting it. Um, but or no no he was no he was pro he was promoting My Soul to Take, and I think he said something about how it ended up being better than Cursed, which they had some problems with. But I don't I don't know the details of it yet. Oh, you can talk about it. Okay, cool. Okay. Even Luna a bit just no major spoilers. Yeah, of course, of course. Talking about Craven's influence. Craven High makes an appearance. Yeah, so uh Francisco and I had like a little catch-up meeting this morning to talk about uh, a feature film that that he has written, he's gonna be directing. And so yeah, we were we were catching up on where he is with production and stuff, or pre-production rather. And uh yeah, it's um pretty much official. I have a role as, as Luna and she basically p plays this like, I, I don't know, it's, she's kind of like an Aubrey Plaza type character, you know, no nonsense. She's like this goth badass and she's the lead singer of this band. And yeah, so that's going to be awesome. But I don't, but production isn't actually starting for like another year or so, but it's just really exciting. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. It's called the slasher movie and they have an Instagram page already. So as soon as they start like doing um, more, more funding and stuff, then I'll be, I'll be promoting the hell out of it. But yeah, I'm really excited. Um, Corey, you lucky duck. I want to see Pearl for sure as soon as possible. Yeah, should be able to. I mean, the they usually in some theaters and some theaters, luckily they always do it at mine. They do like a, a pre premiere kind of screening the Thursday night before the actual Friday release. I don't know why they do that, but like, it's nice for me. <laughs> oh, should I see Barbarian or Pearl tomorrow? <sighs> Listen, I'm kind of biased. It depends how much you loved X, but I would absolutely say Barbarian. See that as soon as you can to avoid spoilers. And while there's still going to be big crowds in the theater, because I think this weekend will be a big weekend for it. There's been a lot of word of mouth, obviously. It's the number one. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it's the number one it's the number one movie in America not even just the number one horror movie so yeah go see Barbarian um oh you got to see the pro premiere on Tuesday and meet Ty West oh cool it's very very worth seeing I'm I'm hoping that I'm gonna like it more than X I feel like I will and I'm I'm actually really excited for Maxine I think that'll probably end up being my favorite of the trilogy because that'll be something fresh you know we're gonna we're gonna follow um, what's her face from from X in in the '80s, so that'll be I mean another '80s period piece. Do we really need that? But like, yeah, I liked her, I liked her character. So, um, oh, I know this has no relation to Wes Craven. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit on my last stream, but yeah, Halle Bailey as Ariel. I'm really excited seeing all the like reactions, like kids watching the trailer for the first time. Some of them made me cry. They were so sweet. They were so sweet. Nightmare on Elm Street just scream and scream are your favorite horror movies? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I'm sure a lot of people in this chat would say the same. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to drop by. Oh, thank you. You kick ass. Keep up the good work. I will do my best. I'll do my best. Yeah, Shocker and Deadly Friend are both weird. We'll, we'll get into that. <laughs> Um, it has been a great year for horror. I know I just rattled those off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a bunch that I'm not even thinking of right now. But yeah, absolutely. 
Oh, I appreciate that, Corey. An effective short. Oh, thank you. Can we to see what else you got up your sleeve? Well, I'm going to be acting in a really good feature length movie in another year or so here. So keep your eyes to the ground. <laughs> uh, thank you for the tip. Wellmeister's here because the trailer is inescapable. I saw the trailer for Don't Worry Darling by accident and I'm reluctantly interested in watching the movie. I fully blame you, Kylie. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's so much of interest about that movie. Even if you're not interested in the drama, it has an interesting premise. If you're not interested in the premise, it's got so much drama behind it. Like, th there's a lot of draw to the movie, you know? So... It's been a good year for horror, I know. One of my or of my top ten films for the year five are horror. Nice, nice. Oh yeah, Va uh, people under the stairs and Vampire in Brooklyn are underrated. Wes Craven. I feel like I feel like people under the stairs is is decently well praised. Vampire in Brooklyn definitely is not, and it's like it's understandable. It's not a good movie, but it's also a lot of fun. So I like I get you. I get you. X is your favorite movie of the year. Okay, all right. Well, then maybe you should see Pearl instead. I don't know. Um, I can't believe you watched all Wes Craven's films. Must have sucked. At times. At times. Oh, thank you for the tip, Rob. Wes Craven is definitely a master of horror, but someone explained what he was thinking when he directed <laughs> Deadly Friend. Just kidding. Um, yeah, that one's admittedly just not one of my favorites. I I can't remember... That was the one with the basketball scene, right? Or is that... Because there's Deadly Friend and then there's Deadly Blessing. And sometimes I, I mix them up. So, yeah. Let, let me know. Okay. Oh, you got your ticket for Pearl last week. Just very excited about it. Nice. Yeah. Oh, right. I've heard of this. Emily the Criminal. Yeah, I've heard that that's really good. And I want to watch it. Aubrey Plaza is... She does some interesting projects. She was in... I don't know if you guys have seen that Mark Duplass movie with her and Jake Johnson. But it's like really quirky little comedy. I think, honestly, I do think that I should include Mark Duplass in my director's series because he, I mean, he did Creep. Um, he did, uh, I can't remember right now. Oh, he did Baghead. Um, I don't know if he, he must've been involved with Creep too, right? Um, and then he's just, he's just done all these really weird little indie projects. I talked about one of his movies with Elizabeth Moss recently. I can't remember the name of that one. Um, but yeah, he's just done some really weird, interesting stuff. I think most recently he did that docu-series on Hulu about the Sasquatch. I started to watch that, but it wasn't really for me. Um, so yeah, I think I want to include him on my, on my series. But anyway, back to the director at hand today. Uh, Barbarian, see Barbarian. I second this. Stormcrow is here. Good to have you. You watched the original Last House on the Left when you were about eight? Oh, why'd you do that? don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. That's not good. That's, I had to skip through a lot of The Last House on the Left. I hope you didn't catch the really bad scenes from that one. Oh my god. Oh, Joel is here. Good to have you too. Good to have you. What's my favorite Wes Craven movie? I guess this is kind of a spoiler for my video because I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be ranking all of his work as well, but it's just really hard to beat Scream. I don't, yeah. It, the, the, my exploration of his entire filmography didn't really change that. <laughs> so I know, I'm, you know, that's that's the basic answer, but alas. And I did, I rewatched uh, the first two A Nightmare on Elm Street movies last night. God, they're so good. I loved the sequel so much more upon this second viewing. I think because like I was just so much more aware of how gay it was. I was like, oh my God. how Because the first time I watched it, I hadn't really heard anything about it and I hadn't explored too much like classic horror at the time either. And I've definitely honed my, my skills of picking up on sub subtext and stuff like that. So I loved it so much more this time around. I honestly, I feel like the first sequel is a little bit underrated. It's got its problems. I know, but, but I think it's a little bit underrated. I know that's not Wes Craven, but like whatever. And then of course watching a nightmare on Elm street, that was just a good time as always. Um, what, oh, where is my layout or what is my layout? Um, so, well, I don't know. I don't really have too much of a layout. I was just going to go over. I have his full filmography pulled up on another tab. So I was just going to kind of go through them. And I just, this is honestly more about getting your guys' opinion. And I might be able to include some of this discussion in my deep dive. So in case, in case there's anything about any of these movies, like interviews, you know, that I should watch, you know, don't be shy. Feel free to share them. Um, and this will kind of just be like, my my initial thoughts on Wes Craven as a director and then 
you know, it'll be a lot more, it'll be a lot more concise and a lot more well thought out and obviously like scripted for the video, but this is just kind of like my initial reaction and I'll go through his whole filmography and everything. Deadly Friend has the basketball exploding ahead, right, right. Yeah, that movie was a mess, but that was the best scene by far. It seems like that's what people always bring up about it too. Oh, does Barbarian have any essay in it trying to get a heads up if it's safe for my partner? So it's all, there are themes about that, especially because there are really heavy themes about like gender politics and stuff like that. But everything is extremely, extremely implicit. I, because I'm somebody that that struggles with the, like those themes and stuff as well, but it's very, very, very implicit. So I, I don't know where your partner's boundaries are with that, but um, there's... Yeah, it's it's really I think it's a really safe easy watch. That but you know, just me. Depends on depends on the boundaries. Um so yeah, maybe sound off in the chat as well like just uh so we get a little bit more opinions so we can kind of find an even even footing on whether or not it's it's a good watch for somebody that has problems with that, but I I do too cuz sometimes when the when those scenes happen and I'm not ready, I will burst into tears. Like it fully gives me like a an anxiety response and I, it was totally fine for me. So there's that. Um, oh, it's very much safe. Okay, good stuff. So you guys are chatting about it in the comments already. Oh, did I see X more than once? Um, I might like it more in the second time. I haven't watched it again because I, I like I just didn't really like it that much the first time. Um, I think that now that I could go in managing my expectations, I would just like enjoy it for what it is. But I was at the time that I watched it, I was expecting more out of it. So who knows? Oh, yes. Great question. What would be a Carpenter film that you would have liked to see Craven direct? What would be a Craven film you would have liked to have seen Carpenter direct? Okay, man. I'm gonna, I'll have to pull up, let me pull up John Carpenter's movies too. Um, John Carpenter filmography. So as far as Carpenter directing a Wes Craven film, oh, geez. Um, you know, Okay, I'll come up with another one too, but I would have loved to see a Carpenter take on Nightmare on Elm Street. Like that, yeah, that would have been really interesting. He, I think he would have done it pretty differently. I think, hmm, maybe, I kind of want to say Vampire in Brooklyn, but um, yeah, actually, no, yeah, I think I'll say Vampire in Brooklyn. Because there, there was just, I don't know, John Carpenter's a really funny guy. I don't, I guess I haven't really, like, seen enough from Wes Craven to, well, no, I mean, Craven, like, he has a really great grip on comedy as well, because, like, obviously he did all the Scream movies, but I don't know, something about the comedy didn't work in Vampire in Brooklyn, I don't know if it's because Eddie Murphy, I think he's credited as a writer, or at least he's a producer, I don't know, um, so maybe that's why it wasn't for me, but I don't know, I think John Carpenter can handle comedy decently well and maybe would have like toned it down a little. So I think I would have liked to see that as far as Craven doing a John Carpenter film. Oh my God. I don't know. Maybe the fog, maybe the fog or, or in the mouth of madness. Cause in the mouth of madness is so bizarre though. I don't, geez, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, or Prince of Dark. Um, okay, listen, I would honestly like any, I, I would find it so fascinating, quite literally with any movie in their fil filmographies. Oh, thank you for the tip. First John Carpenter, now my other favorite horror director, of course. If I weren't already subscribed, I'd do it now. Appreciate that. This is, does this include Wishmaster or those early, more adult ones like Deep Throat? <laughs> um, no, so I, I'm going off of like, well, I'm really going off of Letterbox, and then also I have his whole filmography pulled up on Wikipedia, so I can I'll just share my my screen, so I can show you what I'm working off of. Um, because they actually do include, uh, the Fireworks Woman is actually I think I don't know if it's softcore, but like it is it is porn. So I didn't actually watch that one because it features like this whole incest storyline, and I was like. I'm good. I was like, I'm good. I don't need to see that. Uh, I'm not very interested. Um, but yeah, so th th this also includes a couple things that he did not direct, which I probably won't include in my ranking. Though maybe maybe Dream Warriors because he was an executive producer, he just didn't direct it. 
Um, and then I don't think I'm going to include Paris Jetame either because this was a, he just did a segment because there's like 20 directors that, that did this and it's an anthology or I don't know, maybe I should watch his segment, but, uh. and then I'll probably, I'll probably include The Hills Have Eyes too because I think on Letterboxd he is credited as the director. I don't know why though. Anyway, so yeah, this is kind of what I'm working off of, but yeah, Scream is the ultimate. I know. I know. Yeah, Last House on the Left was so bad and unnecessary. I would agree. I guess I guess now we can kind of start getting into his filmography since I pulled that up. But yeah, his directorial debut was was The Last House on the Left, which if you don't know, I mean, I would say don't watch it. I don't know. I don't know anybody that needs to watch that movie, to be honest. There's really, really extended graphic scenes of, like, assault, and it's just, and it's really horribly made. Like, 1972, you know, his super early work. I, one thing, though, that, that did kind of bring things into perspective for me that I think I want to include in my deep dive is, like, this man grew up in a Baptist household, and they were very, very strict. The only movies he was allowed to watch growing up were Disney films, and so when he, I think it wasn't until he was in college that he watched his his first non-Disney movie. He made it to to college without like really being aware of cinema. Um and so it it kind of makes more sense to me now why Last House on the Left and some of his early work is like so depraved because he like as a child and all growing up was incredibly deprived of so much culture. So like in a, in a way, it, it does actually, like, make sense to me now. Still not a fan of it. <laughs> Still not a fan of it. But I, I do kind of get it. I just, he was, like, obviously really, I don't know, just out of touch. And then also, of course, like, in the 70s, like, things were really, they were a lot more grimy back then. And it was, it was before the MPAA or whatever was, like, you know, had a heavier hand on things. But anyway, yeah, exactly. There was just, well, I'm not going to pull this up because it has a, the R word, I'll say essay. There, there were a bunch of essay scenes, yeah, in the 70s. Definitely. Um, let's see. Oh, can't wait to hear about your thoughts on My Soul to Take. Only saw it once, but absolutely hated that movie. Talked about it a, just a tad bit early on in the stream, but I'll, I'll get back to it. We'll circle back. Absolutely. Freddy's really scary in A Nightmare on Elm Street, too. Yeah, he's he's definitely a more brutal version of himself. I think he's definitely scarier in, in that sequel than in the, the original, but yeah. Um, oh, I meant your prop like you didn't. Don't worry, darling. I know I don't have a prop for today. There's just, the, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of drama to cover. I would just have like maybe a list of his movies or something. Not too visually interesting, I don't think. Um, oh, you think I like fairy tale? Oh, good. You're about 200 pages into it. Um, no, I don't think he has yet. Or actually, I don't know. He reads so much. He might be, but yeah, I'll have him send it to me soon. Your first ever horror movie was A Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, good. That's good. Yeah. Um, let's see. You wish Johnny Depp was in more of Wes Craven's films. Yeah, it's and he almost was. He was almost in A New Nightmare. He would have done it too, but he got too shy to ask him or something. And then Depp said that he would have done it. So, bummer. Um, Wes Craven loves chatty humanoid killers. Very true. Both Freddy and Ghostface run around and get hurt in the third act. Yeah, and in let's see, let's what else too? I mean, yeah, that all of his all of his killers are very much human. I mean, like the hills have eyes too, the last house on the left. He likes to he seems to like to explore um the the darker side of man, which is what horror is all about. But yeah, he's really got to focus on human beings. Oh, crack. No, not that not on that side today. Okay. But yeah, I mean, Red Eye, I guess, I mean, Cursed is like one of the only, Cursed and A Nightmare on Elm Street are really the only, uh, what, what's the word? Why can't I think of the word? Like supernatural. <laughs> was the only real like supernatural stuff he did. Aside from that, um, even, even uh, Serpent in the Rainbow, which is about zombies, that's based on fact. It's not entirely fiction. There are, there were actually essentially real zombies that were created, but it was sort of a, a mind wiping technique, I guess that, um, I don't know, in, indigenous peoples of, of Haiti did actually practice. So yeah, even that was not, w was still kind of grounded in reality and same with like people under the stairs. Yeah. 
Oh, the lady whose head explodes in Deadly Friend was in the Goonies and Throw Mama from the Train. Oh, interesting. I haven't watched Goonies in so long. I feel like I should. Um... Oh, thank you for the tip, Rob. Which Craven franchise had a bigger impact on pop culture, A Nightmare on Elm Street or Scream? I would say Scream just because, just because of my generation, and I would say like millennials as well, because we, that's the one that connects with, with my generation more. Um, and I think that it's also why like Scream is back in the cinemas and you were already getting Scream 6 and everything like that. I think it just has more of a pop cultural impact because it it the Scream movies break the third wall, not the fourth wall where they're like speaking to us directly, but they break the third wall in the sense of they're talking about movies that we actually know. Like, you know, they're, they're talking about Jordan Peele and Jurassic Park and all that kind of stuff in these new movies. So there's just a lot more personal, I feel um, then A Nightmare on Elm Street and just, I, I don't know what it is, but most people my age, I would say, you know, a good amount of them probably would have seen Scream, but a lot of them I don't think would have seen A Nightmare on Elm Street, but that's just, that's just my experience. So I don't know. I know that A, a Nightmare on Elm Street, of course, like back then, obviously was one of the big three and it, it, it kept, it kept going, you know, beyond Scream and we got the remake and everything, but yeah, I would still say Scream, for sure. Oh, you met the cinematographer on Dream Warriors. That's sick. Were they nice? Were they cool? Um, how come I hate Jeepers Creep? I don't, I don't hate the movies, but, like, there's just the whole issue of the director of the original trilogy that just, like, really grosses me out. I've, I've seen the original movie. I don't think I thought it was bad, but I just, I don't know. I wasn't that impressed. I just didn't really like it. Um... Oh, hey, everyone. Sending love and light to everyone. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Oh, I would have loved a Carpenter and Craven collaboration. I know. And even on a... There was that anthology movie that John Carpenter did, Body Bags, which I talked about during my Carpenter deep dive. And Wes Craven was a was a guest star. He had a little cameo in Body Bags. So that was like the only taste that we ever really got. I, I believe a lot of the genius of Scream should be credited to Kevin Williamson. Yeah, of course. Craven always praised uh, the screenplay when discussing Scream. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and also because I've I've been looking at some behind the scenes stuff with Scream and, you know, just part of my research. So apparently Wes Craven had had passed on it. He, the story changes a little bit from interview to interview. So the truth is somewhere in the middle. But basically he said that he had passed on Scream when, when he first saw it. Because he was like, oh, I don't want to go back to doing things that are that violent. That feels like the beginning of my career. I don't want to do that. Um, and then it went up for auction. And then I guess it, it didn't sell or something. And in one interview, he says it was a year later that he did finally, like, accept and he decided to go back to it because some fan came up to him at a convention and told him that he had gone soft or something. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. The story changes a little bit. But, yeah, I would, I would absolutely credit Kevin Williamson, who, fun fact, he basically locked himself in a room in the desert for three days and wrote Scream in three days, which I never knew. But it, I guess because his rent was, like, three months past due and he was struggling and he was like, I gotta write this script. So yeah, just wild how Scream came to be. Vampires and Ghosts of Mars are underrated. I can't give anyone other than John Carpenter for Prince of Darkness in my view. Vampire, I didn't like either. I couldn't even finish Ghosts of Mars. I thought that was so bad, to be honest. Um, and Vampires, I didn't think was that much better, but I did finish it. So it's always the incest storylines. Inside jokes. Inside jokes. Uh, thank you for the tip, Wellmeister. Remember when I said Daniel Harris wanted to do a proper Halloween 6? She just did a podcast where she laid out the idea. It would continue the psychic link between her and Michael. She said she's already talked to Malik Akkad. <gasps> exciting. Oh, exciting. That's such good news. Um, especially because the, well... We'll see what happens. I mean, this newest Halloween trilogy has made so much money. I do wonder if the rights are going to extend with Blumhouse or if they really go back. They, they will They will really go back to Akkad and he'll have a chance to do this. So it'll be interesting to see. So anyway. Yeah, I won't watch Last House on the Left again. It's got too much tasteless violence. I could barely watch it the first time through. I skipped, I gotta say, like a solid 20 minutes of that movie. I was just like, no, no, I don't want to see that. Deadly Blessing is an underrated Craven film. They're all starting to blur together for me a little bit. I didn't love that one. That, that's all I remember, though. 
Um, oh, Last House was originally intended to be hardcore. He still kind of dodged a bullet. He did. He did. Yeah. I mean, I've said many times, like, back then, the only way to get into the industry was to direct a horror or direct porn. So, they did what they had to do, you know? Ugh. Oh, right, yeah, this was inspired by by Ingmar Berg, uh, Bergman's The Virgin Spring, a Swedish art house film, while also making a grindhouse film. Because that's what was easy to make on a low budget. Oh, interesting, okay. Thank you. Um... You accidentally clicked dislike and then got a message saying feedback share with creator. Um, I don't know. I yeah, I do get messages from YouTube. I get I get emails when pretty much anything happens. Yeah, not for like comments though. Luckily, I think that's turned off because that would be insane. But yeah, um, I don't think I get notified when you dislike a video though because that would be nuts. Do they bring the dislike button back? Is that back? Anyway. It's kind of it's kind of weird, like the existence of the dislike button. I guess that's more for audiences, but it's still a form of engagement. I don't know if it really does anything to help you out if like you don't like the content, and you don't want to see that type of content again. I don't know because it still counts as engagement. It's very confusing. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, super interesting to think about the link between his extreme first films and his sheltered childhood. <laughs> Kylie, the psychiatrist in the house. I would I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. But yeah, it's really fascinating. I want to cuz he just kind of goes through a brief overview of his childhood in a, in a lot of these interviews and I would like to know a little bit more about it. Though it is really interesting. He I think he's so good at writing um you know scary male figures and stuff cuz he he has said that some of the only memories he has of his father is he remembers feeling scared of him. His father left his family, I think, when he was, like, four, and then he passed away in the same year. So he, the only memories he has are, like, from when he was a toddler. So obviously they're really fuzzy, but he just remembers being scared of him. So that's another thing that's interesting as well that I think, you know, probably definitely influenced some of his work. <clears throat> crack the hell out of that back. I do it all day long, too. Yeah. Oh, my God. I crack my back all the time. Your favorite Wes Craven has to be The People Under the Stairs. I think that's a good choice. It's going to be remade by Jordan Peele, so I'm curious to see what he does with it. Yeah. Oh, good to have you. If you guys haven't haven't checked out um, the Double Horror Pack podcast, you guys should. Um, yeah, we talked a little bit about, the, about a little bit about The People Under the Stairs when we went on the Sledgehammer Horror Channel a while back. But yeah, that one ended up being so much better than I expected. I don't know what I expected because I hadn't heard too much about it. Um, and it ended up being like a four out of five star film for me. I thought it was amazing. Like the commentary was, was excellent, very on the nose, but like, whatever, like it was well done. I think that's another thing that I noticed too, is like, um, yeah, Craven very consistently employed like a lot of black actors. And I know, I mean, horror historically has always been queer. It's always been diverse because you know what, you know what else too is in one of his interviews, he was saying he's always so kind about his fans. That's another thing I'm noticing from a lot of his interviews. He's always like, he's always just so thankful. And in one interview, he was talking about how he feels like so many, so many people in his audience are kind of the outcasts of society. He's like, he, he describes some of them. I think he said something like a lot of my, a lot of my audience, when I meet them, they're kind of the the long haired alternative type and they're kind of the outcasts of society and they, but they're the smartest. They're always the first ones to understand what it is, what I'm doing with my films. Um, he's like, I just have a very intelligent audience and stuff. And I forget why I started talking about this, but here we are. <laughs> here we are. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have, I, I have a lot of respect for him now like watching his interviews and stuff it, it the one weird thing though is he also does sing some high praises about the wine scenes and stuff and has stories to tell about them and it's weird it's weird in retrospect um just because like he, i don't know that him being so close with them it's like you really knew that nothing like you didn't know what was going on anyway anyway oh we were talking about the people under the stairs and then somehow i ended up here tangents every time thank you for the tip only saw it once but wasn't my soul to take kind of supernatural it is yeah you're right also he was only a producer but the the gin is that how that's pronounced is wish Ma in wish in wishmaster is supernatural okay he so he was yeah he was just a producer on wishmaster so yeah i probably won't include that one i really want to focus on like his his directing work so yeah i don't think i'll put that one in there 
Uh, the only the only non-directed movie that I'm gonna throw in, I think, is probably gonna be the Dream Mass or the or Dream Warriors, right? Because he, I can't remember. Let me let me see if he he wrote that one. Yeah, he yeah. So he he was a writer on on Dream Warriors. Yeah. Although maybe, and he was a writer on The Hills Have Eyes too, but he didn't direct that one, but he wrote and produced it. So I think I'll include that one. Yeah, yeah. And he was an executive producer on Dream Warriors, so I'll include that too. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. God, not my stream of consciousness just like always coming out. Oh my God. Yeah, he was super nice and knowledgeable. He absolutely was. Cursed may may not have been as bad or disappointing if the studio allowed him to make the film he originally wanted to make. Yeah, maybe. I still really like Cursed. I still really, really like it. It feels like, it really does feel um, like a, it feels like a satire. It feels like a werewolf satire. And I don't know that it maybe didn't come through well enough. Kind of like, kind of like how I feel about bodies, bodies, bodies. But curse, I felt like I understood that it was satire. Like it was so, it was so dumb and over the top. And it stars, I mean, it stars Christina Ritchie, uh, uh, Jesse Eisenberg, Judy Greer. Like just such a, <laughs> such a crazy cast. Judy Greer, I don't think is is praised as the horror icon that she is. I mean, come on. She, I mean, I know, okay, Jurassic Park, it's not totally horror, but Jurassic Park and the Halloween movies now and Cursed, and I feel like there's something I'm forgetting. Was she? No, she wasn't a Valentine. She, I feel, she, there's something else. There's something else. She's kind of a scream queen. She kind of is. Yeah, it's, yeah, scream grows with us. This is very true. And same with the people that we root for. And one of the only slashers, really, or slasher franchises where the characters matter so much, you know? In Nightmare on Elm Street, we do have Nancy, but she's, and she's not even a total through line through the whole thing. So I think that's also why Scream is more impactful. Because, I mean, Sydney and Gail, I mean, come on. Oh, the, yeah, there was another Justin Long horror that released the same day as Barbarian. Oh, I thought it I thought it didn't release until, like, next weekend. The House of Darkness. It's not bad. Oh, so you've seen it. Okay, it is out. Didn't hate it. Barbarian is better, though. Yeah, I, I think that one is also, like, a another kind of psychological thriller. So I'm excited to watch that one, too. Just didn't realize it was out. Um, oh, got a question. If you were in a Scream movie, what character would you play? Oh, geez. I don't know. I think I would have a lot of fun playing a killer, but like as far as me, myself, what kind of character I would be? Oh, geez. I don't know. Is it, is it egotistical to say I feel like I would be kind of one of the, kind of like one of the final girls? Because I feel like that would be me, but that's just because like I'm a horror fan and I know what to look out for, you know? So I feel like I would, I feel like I'd handle my own in a Scream movie. I don't know. Um... My thoughts on the last house on the left. Such an odd watch. We've been we've been talking about it. That's the one we kicked off his filmography with. Not a fan. Can't say I'm a fan. Oh, love my videos and letterbox reviews. Thank you. Appreciate that. I honestly don't really shout out my letterbox that much, but it's a good time. I mean, if you enjoy if you enjoy my lawlessness on Twitter, then I think you would enjoy my letterbox. It has the same it has a similar tone to my Twitter. So yeah, follow me over there. Thank you for the tip, Mega Movies. Wes Craven holds such a special place in my heart. He's the reason I fell in love with horror because of watching Scream at 9 or 10. Thank you, Wes. Aw. That's very sweet. I'm glad that you shared. Yeah, you know what? And Scream, I would have to credit Scream 2 as really, like, making me absolutely fall in love with the genre. I mean, if you guys have been around, you know that I have grown up on the Goosebumps books and Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark and The Corpse Bride has been one of my favorite movies since I was five years old. So like I've always been into horror and you know my grandpa showed me horror all growing up and stuff. But it wasn't until I think I was, I think I was 16, 15 or 16 when I discovered the Scream franchise. And that just like wow, that really propelled me. I might even have to credit scream and craven and all of that like for why i ended up eventually wanting to go to film school you know so yeah i mean craven has had a, has had a big impact on us all i would say oh can't stay no worries but have we talked about red eye yet it's no we haven't talked about it yet but we'll get there it's i i really like that movie i think it's very enjoyable and yeah it's it's very it's very comforting it is as well i don't know if it's just the early 2000s vibes because it came out in 2005 i think but yeah Anyway, 
Oh, hey, good to have you. Glad to have you here. Yeah, I was a little kid that called Craven out on Scream. <laughs> I know. I was a little kid that came up to him. Um, oh, your godfather was on production design on the people under the stairs and your first set visit. That's so cool. I, I would love to hear more about that. Let us know. Absolutely let us know. Ghost of Mars is just god awful. I would agree. I would agree. Um, you would watch anything that has Pam Greer. That's fair. That's a fair point to make. There were so many stars in that movie too. Jason Statham is also there. Uh, can't remember who else, but yeah, it's so like watching it in retrospect and it's so star studded is funny because they, it was just the early 2000s. It was like 2001 and all these people were just getting their start in acting. It's really funny. <laughs> Kevin Williamson. Yeah. was a huge Halloween fan. Big influence on Scream. Absolutely. I mean, of course, yeah, it's referenced so much in Scream as well. Oh, and it was also inspired by the Gainesville Ripper. Oh, cool. Good to know. Good to know. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I didn't even, I haven't even mentioned this. I'm so proud of you. The director of Barbarian sharing my YouTube. Yeah, I, that was, <laughs> that was a lot. That, that definitely has provided me with enough serotonin and dopamine and all the happy hormones to last me like the rest of the month I think um yeah insane I if you guys don't follow me on social media yeah he he I don't even know how he found it I don't know like I don't know how it happened I feel I still feel really flustered about the whole thing because I just I'm like what um yeah the director shared my barbarian review on twitter and then um I also have some news. It's not set in stone yet, um, but I would maybe mark your calendars for the 25th this month for a live stream because somebody involved in Barbarian may or may not be coming on my channel. <laughs> yeah, one thing led to another with the director sharing my review and and um, somebody really cool might be coming on my channel soon. So I don't want to jinx it though because it's not like fully set, but they, they seem really down. So yeah, we're, we're working on that. Um, anyway. Oh, oh, they have a dislike button. Oh, they don't show the number anymore? Wait, no, don't, but don't they, though? Because a bunch of people, like, um, over a million people disliked the new Little Mermaid trailer, right? Nuts. Jesus Christ. Um, oh, we don't see, but Kylie will. How did they see the dislikes on, on the new Ariel video? Anyway. Oh, if I could choose, or if I could work with Craven or act with Craven in one of his films, which, <sighs> scream, scream, of course, of course, yeah, I know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things are going to come back to scream today. Um, oh, the thing I always remember about Last House is a line that Craven said, you want to be entertained by violence? He wanted to make it as ugly as possible. That is so interesting. That's so interesting. I wonder if there was any, I wonder if there was another layer to that. If he was like just trying to make commentary on grindhouse horror. I don't know. I don't know. I kind of doubt it, but maybe. He's always had an eye for discovering fresh talent. Absolutely. Something that contributes to the success of his films. So impressed with giving a lot of actors a good start. Definitely. Yeah. Especially with Scream. Oh my gosh. Oh, the cinematographer of Dream Warriors was nice and knowledgeable. That's good to hear. It's always, I, I love to hear the good stories of like when you meet people in Hollywood and they're actually nice. I love that. Um, oh, oh, oops. Okay, sorry. I was reading the chat and sometimes it just jumps on me. Yeah, Drew Barrymore was supposed to play Sydney in Scream. Do you know, she was actually attached to Scream before Wes Craven was. That was something I learned as well. Um, and then she, she was also interviewed for the behind the scenes and she had just mentioned something like before I knew I wanted to like work with Craven on this and like have him come on, I needed to make sure that I trusted him. And, you know, because it was a really difficult filming process for her. She was always covered in blood and running. It was very physical and same thing for Nev Campbell too. Craven actually also mentioned he told Nev Campbell filming this was going to be like a boot camp, which it was. I hadn't even really considered that before, but you know, she's really fit anyways. Anyways. Yeah. Drew was originally supposed to play Sydney, but then she wanted to be in the opening, which is just amazing. Thank you for the tip. I stayed away from the people under the stairs for a while because I confused it for Last House on the Left, which is not my kind of movie. Yeah, when I finally watched it, I was surprised how good it was. Me too. I, I knew it was going to be good because there, you know, some of my friends have sung really high praises for it. I didn't know it was going to be that good. 
but yeah, I really liked it. Oh, Judy Greer was in Jawbreaker. 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 I've still never seen that. I, I can't believe I've still never seen that. I mean, it's been on my list forever, but yeah, I definitely see you as a killer in a screen movie. Appreciate that. I'm going to, I'm going to have the chance to play, um, you know, a badass rock and roll punk goth kind of chick. So get to do something close to it. Kylie would be the Randy or Mindy in a screen movie. That's also fair to say. I could be both. They've never, they've never done that. They've never made the horror nerd the killer in the movie. They should do that. They should do that. When will I review Rob Zombie's filmography? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I'm definitely a final girl. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Oh, something happened to the original footage of Cursed. It's gone forever. I'll, I'll look into that. I'll look into that. We'll never get a director's cut. That's so sad. I'll look into that though, for sure. <clears throat> I would be related to the Meeks. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Cast Kylie as a ghost face. All right. little mixed responses in the chat, but I say we just roll them all into one, you know? <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you for the tip. You're including The Last House on the Left too? No. No. I'm including... Did I say Last House on the Left? I meant Hills Have Eyes. My bad. Because Craven was a producer. He was also a producer of the remake. Um, I, I would only include the remake if he also was a writer on that, which actually I think he was. Ugh. I haven't watched those. Does this mean I have to watch those now? I don't want to. <laughs> I don't really want to. Oh my gosh. Oh, thank you. Congrats. Congrats. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, 925, manifest it. Uh, you're right. You're right. I, I shouldn't be talking about jinxing myself. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Uh, he probably just typed in barbarian review. Yeah, I mean... I, I guess so. I just, I think that there's a lot of bigger channels that have reviewed the movie, so I don't feel like mine would pop up first, but I, I don't know. I theorize he probably was just, like, watching them as they rolled in, you know, over the past few days, because everybody's, everybody's been loving it, so he's like, hell yeah, another one. Um, and then he just really liked it, so yeah. Yeah. Um... Doing the dang thing? Absolutely. Got Justin Long? No. I, that man is a little bit too booked and busy. So, no, I, I don't think I can get Justin Long on my channel, <laughs> but that'd be cool. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a movie called Superhost. I have seen it. When it came out, the director actually commented under my review, and I'm a small channel compared to you. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, you know, it has happened to me before, like, with, with Vinny and Never Hike Alone. That happened to me, like, two years ago, and now I'm on, I'm on set with him, so I knew it could happen, but when it's, Listen, when it's the number one movie in America, you don't, you don't, you're not really ready for the director to be seeing your review of it. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I'm still, I just, I'm still so like, you know, I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> your hot take, hot take on Wes Craven. Okay. He made two masterpieces, but nothing else I've seen has any appeal for me at all. Last House and Hills are awful. Didn't see people under the stairs yet. I would recommend people under the stairs. It's not, it's not a masterpiece. Um, I, I couldn't even say it's like great. I, I thought it was really good, really good entertainment value, really interesting commentary that's well done. So I think it's absolutely worth watching at the very least. And then, I mean, of everything else, I would also recommend Curse, honestly, just because like, if you love dark comedies and you love the early 2000s and things that are just, like, so dumb and over the top, Cursed is going to be for you. And Red Eye also is, honestly, it's an effective thriller. I think Red Eye is good. It has um, Rachel McAdams, Queen, and it has Killian Murphy, King. Like, you know? So those are worth watching as well, I would say. Um, let's see uh oh jawbreaker is a masterpiece yeah I, i've heard good things i've heard really good things and but i'm a cheerleader i haven't seen that either <laughs> crazy judy greer has been in so much sucks she won't be in halloween ends i know i know unless unless they retcon the ending of halloween kills <laughs> somehow but i don't think so Oh, just joined. What did I miss? Uh, we've actually, we've barely gone into it. I've been live for 50 minutes already. So let me, let me just like walk you through some of the, some of the lesser known stuff and then we can get to a nightmare on Elm Street. So up next after Last House on the Left, it wasn't until three years later that Fireworks Woman was released, which is the um, incest porn movie that he did. So 
going to blow right past that. Uh, the next one would be The Hills Have Eyes, which I'll be honest, I don't really get that one. Uh, the, the, I actually, I actually ended up really enjoying the sequel, funnily enough, which a lot of people have said, don't even bother with the sequel. Like, don't waste your time on The Hills Have Eyes too. I thought that it was just kind of like dumb and a good time. I gave it two and a half out of five stars. Listen, that might've also been generous, but I think the entertainment value was good. Like I, I had fun watching it and it, and it did maintain my attention, which I can't say for a lot of his other movies. So yeah so then there was uh so then there was the hills have eyes but like okay let me let me know your guys thoughts actually let's let's actually pause on the hills have eyes because i don't know if i'm missing something if it's kind of because it's kind of like when i watched uh, you know the texas chainsaw massacre or halloween for the first time i didn't have the kind of appreciation for older like classic lower budget stuff i mean don't get me wrong because I, I grew up on on 50 sci-fi horror so obviously i do appreciate older stuff but i don't know there was just something about like the quality of some 70s horror i couldn't get into so i don't know if that's what it is but now i mean obviously now like i love texas chainsaw massacre i love halloween so i don't i don't think it's a problem with the time period that i have i think the movie just is like not that good so I don't, I don't know because it's like kind of, it's a like kind of a cult classic now, but like, I don't know. <laughs> Kylie pulling double duty as final girl in Ghostface. Yeah. You know, why not both? Why not both? Um, oh, I'm late, but, uh, Wes's earlier work sucked due to studio interference. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. The remake is absolutely brutal. Yeah. I don't think, I, I don't want to see that really. I don't really want to see that. <laughs> Oh, how would you rank the decades in which Craven has directed? 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Oh, listen, I gotta go. I think I gotta go 90s and number one because, you know, we got Scream 2, 3. Oh, no, wait. Sc 3 was, was, that was released in 2000. So I guess that doesn't count, but like the original and Scream 2. We have those in the 90s and that's some of his best work, I think. Um, although mm, I really love Scream 4. That's technically the 2010s, but it was the last movie he directed. Mm, I don't know. I really, I really do enjoy uh, his 2000s work or like a couple of them, you know, Red Eye and Cursed, I think are really fun and obviously Scream 3 and Scream 4. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think I would have to put 2000s second and then the 80s. Yeah. Oh, and People Under the Stairs is also 90s. So I think the 90s was definitely his, his best work. And then 70s is dead last. That's for sure. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. Petition for Vinny to direct the next Friday the 13th movie. Honestly, honestly, I think they're kind of like, I feel like they're kind of just like purposefully avoiding even acknowledging him. I don't know, because they've done a little bit of promo and they're teasing, oh, there's going to be another Friday movie next year or something. So they've been teasing that. And then, of course, like with the Womp Stomp Films account, they've been like replying under it and showing their promo and stuff. And it looks so good. And I think even on one post, Vinny was like, hold my beer and like put a, put a scream grab of, of Never Hike Alone 2. I feel like they're just like, we don't see it. We, who wants to Never Hike Alone? Like what? And it's just, I think they're just biting themselves in the butt because they, sh they, they should hire him. They should. Yeah. Chris has a great cast. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah, the kid and people under the stairs is mint. Yeah, so well worth a look. I know the the kid. He oh, one of the best final boys. Now he's on my final boys list. Absolutely, definitely. They right. They could put Judy Greer and Halloween Ends as a flashback. This is true. This is true. Um, are you you've seen people under the stairs and it was okay. Only okay, especially one of the actors, um, Brandon Adams. I haven't really seen much of his work to be honest. Kylie just skips over his adult film. I should call it an adult film. I don't know why I, why I haven't been using that terminology. But yeah, the adult film. I did it, I did find it online somewhere after like a bunch of, of hunting around. Uh, and I, I started it, but then like the very first sequence was, it was honestly kind of a vibe. There was like this, this like campfire and everybody around it was just like naked, but a lot of them were also like going at it. And I was like, I don't need to watch this. <laughs> I was like, I don't need to watch this. So yeah, just not for me. Not for me. 
you liked the remake of the hills have eyes a lot more i don't i don't doubt that it's a better movie because i'm sure i mean it has craven's involvement and then also they had like a way bigger budget obviously so i don't doubt that it's better i just feel like the brutality and there's probably some other elements of it that are not going to be for me so so what about Wishmaster? he produced it i'm only going to include that if he wrote it as well luckily i have seen that movie but yeah only if he has a writing credit because i think like just producing i mean it's like it's the way that i did it with with john carpenter where you know he, i i didn't even i could not i couldn't include everything in his filmography because obviously he's done a lot of score work and things like that so i really just stuck to what he directed which was 24 films like that was a lot <laughs> so i let me see with what's craven how many would there be One, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 25 so about the same actually interesting yeah and that's enough i think that's enough didn't like grindhouse style films yeah me either i think that was wes's early aesthetics during the hills it was it absolutely was and it was just like a thing of the 70s too but then but then you also have toby hooper's texas chainsaw massacre where there's hardly any gore i mean it's very it's rough you know, for sure, and very grimy and gritty, but it's no, it's no last house on the left, I will say, yeah, yeah, Hills Have Eyes, looks bad, has no stories, complete waste of time, no idea why it's considered by some a masterpiece, I think, I mean, there, there's just, I think we're finding out now, there's, a, there are a lot of movies that are cult classics and not, like, true classics, because I do feel like a lot of people kind of conflate going to the theater and be being really shocked at the time and it having that historical impact of like doing something new and different versus it actually being a good movie that can stand the test of time because there's I mean obviously all the best horror movies in history they've done something really shocking I mean I think Barbarian for example is you know one of them is the most shocking film of the year probably um so it's going to cement its place we'll see how well it holds up when it becomes part of pop cultural history and things get spoiled before you even watch the film for future generations and stuff because it's like you know the um you know that this in the second star wars movie there's the, the biggest plot twist ever basically in cinematic history but because it's such a pop cultural thing that like everybody knows you know the twist before you ever see the movie so it's, it's one of those things where it's like i don't know was it just because it was shocking for the time or was it actually a really good movie and the hills have eyes i don't think was actually a good movie i think it was just like i think it just really disturbed people um oh i've heard of high tension but it's a french is it like a french extremism film or whatever those are called because i don't think that's gonna be for me i don't know i don't know about that okay francisco would say 90s 2000s 80s okay same okay same same <laughs> You enjoyed My Soul to Take. I, I feel like if I was younger, I would have really liked it and I would have found it really scary. Because even on Letterboxd too, I said this feels like the kind of movie that you would put on at 1 a.m. at a sleepover when you're 12. And I feel like I probably, if I was 12, I would have thought it was the best, scariest horror movie ever made, I'm sure. But um, today, not so much. Today, not so much. Um, the original Hills Have Eyes shows the dichotomy of family. This is true. This is true. There's the wholesome American family and the evil mutant family. It's also a spiritual sequel to the OG Texas Chainsaw Massacre because they share the, set, the same set designer. That's really interesting. Thank you for pointing that out for me. That's interesting. I mean, that that's true. I won't deny, you know, symbolism, whatever, that all that good stuff. But uh, aside from that, it's like somebody said, yeah, not really a lot of not really a lot of plot, kind of a, kind of a bore to follow. You love the ending of Summer of Fear. The rest of the movie was just okay. Yeah, I actually really enjoyed Summer of Fear. Or it's also called, um, what is it also called? Someone in Someone in My House or something. It has different names on Letterboxd, the, the name of the movie and the, the poster. But I'm going to call it Summer of Fear because it's on the poster. But um, I actually ended up really liking that one. But I still only gave it three stars. It's not great. It's also made for TV. But um, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. My my all-time favorite director, you know, I'm going to find out. I think because I've never had a solid answer for that. I I did used to just say, oh, Jordan Peele, Ari Aster. Because, you know, they've, they've both made these two masterpieces that I adore. But I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, for most of my life growing up, I would say it would be like Steven Spielberg, Tim Burton. 
Um, but I, but in doing this director series, I'm really, I'm going to get to the bottom of that and I'm really going to find out who my favorite is, I think. Oh, you had Vinny on your podcast. Cool. He would love to direct a legit Friday movie. I know he, he's been saying like, they just, they, they should hand him the reins. They really should. Yeah. If, if, wait, if Michael can keep coming back, then so can Judy Greer. Yeah, absolutely. Fool is definitely on my final boys list. I know. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, oh, the remake of The Hills Have Eyes is much more graphic. I don't, I don't think I want to see that. I just don't think I want to see that. Uh, oh, Justin Long is also a scream queen. Absolutely. He's done a lot of horror. I, I feel like him and he, he and Judy Greer both aren't really paid their due for, for what they've done for horror. I mean, Justin Long has done two this year alone. And I mean, Jeepers Creepers, he did an episode of Creep Show, Tusk, like, come on, come on. Wes is your favorite director. Hell yeah. Elm Street is my favorite, but I love New Nightmare, People Under the Stairs, Hills. You love Hills? Do share why. Do share why. I'd like to know. Um, Scream, all the screams, Shocker, Swamp Thing, Serpent. Hot Take, My Soul to Take is awesome. It certainly is wild. It certainly is wild. You never catch the lives? Well, good to have you. Good to have you. Um, oh, thank you for the tip. Brandon Adams, the kid from The People Under the Stairs. I'm not too familiar with his f filmography aside from The Mighty Ducks. I actually, I do think I have seen The Mighty Ducks, but I was like a kid. Um, he is also in the underrated 90s horror classic, Ghost in the Machine. All right. I'll throw that on the old watch list. Ghost in the... Ghost... <laughs> Ghost in the Machine. 93. Sounds right up my alley. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Serpent in the Rainbow was weird. I agree. Not my favorite. Not, not my favorite. Uh, oh, I'd say They Live is the best John Carpenter film, but can't decide on Wes Craven's best. They Live is really enjoyable, but definitely, definitely no The Thing, I'll say. Um... <clears throat> Oh, I think I love my soul to take because I remember going to see it when I was 10. That tracks. See, that's th that's exactly what I said. Like, if I was 12, that movie would have been great. But alas, you know, <laughs> alas. Never Hike Alone was great. It is. I love it. Oh, my favorite. Oh, you. Oh, you. Oh, stop. Oh, stop it. Um, oh, which West movie had the snake in the bath? Isn't that Deadly, Deadly Blessing? I think that's it's either Deadly Blessing or Deadly Friend. Listen, as I said, I... <laughs> get those mixed up. Anyway, um, let's see. Okay. Let's, what's next? We got, we got a little stuck on the hills have eyes up next would be deadly blessing. And then, Oh, swamp thing. That one was kind of a shock because it had a little bit of a star studded cast It has Adrian Barbo. And then oh, who else was it? Who else was in this? Um, Oh, Ray wise. Yeah. That was, that was surprising. Yeah. Ray wise is in it and Adrian Barbo. Um, but that one apparently was one of the most difficult that, that they ever shot. I, I mean, like just through all the interviews and stuff, there have been so many horror stories about it. I guess they, they all had to wear these big waders because they shot in a swamp for like six weeks. And so there were alligators all around them, but I guess they were little guys. So they kind of just, it kind of just worked around them. There were these uh, stinging caterpillars they were dropping from the trees like the plague and like stinging them. So they were dealing with that. Um, they There was a bunch of studio involvement and things got really, really messy and uh, didn't have a good enough budget. There, oh, there was some sort of, there was some sort of like uh, algae in the swamp or some kind of fungus. I can't remember. That was, that was melting the costume off of the creature actor or off of Ray Wise as the Swamp Thing. So the Swamp Thing costume was getting all like melted, like chemically melting. And they just had a lot of problems on that movie. And I thought it was a really cool concept. It was kind of, kind of just giving Creature from the Black Lagoon, but with its own twist. And uh, it just was really bad. It just was really bad, but it makes more sense to me now because behind the scenes, it was just, it was atrocious to make. So yeah, Swamp Thing was next. And then what else we have before? Oh, the, his next his next movie was A Nightmare on Elm Street, actually, which was also so interesting. The backstory of A Nightmare on Elm Street, he uh, apparently had gone broke in the three years between uh, shooting his projects. So uh, the Swamp Thing came out in 1982. So she, they shot that, I think, in 1981. 
Um, and so then in the span of those three years, he was kind of living off that money from Swamp Thing and I guess Deadly Blessing, The Hills Have Eyes a little bit. And he had written the script of Nightmare on Elm Street, I think over the course of like a year. And then over the next couple of years, he was trying to sell it everywhere and was just getting nose, 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 nose. And then eventually, um, I don't know, there was a producer at New Line that ended up finding the money. I think he said Bob Shea. I think it was Bob Shea. Um, yeah. And so they ended up finding the money and just, just wild because he felt like he had something special. He had taken it to some of his friends and they all thought, oh yeah, this is a great scary concept. Like, you know, this, this would be a good movie. And then all the studios just, they just kept saying no, no, no. And so finally, yeah, in 84, we got A Nightmare on Elm Street and, and thank goodness for that. Oh, OG Hills Have Eyes is your favorite Craven movie, but I'll admit I haven't seen all of them. Wow. Wow. Um, let's see. Oh, always excited to see him in new movies. I've always appreciated seeing him. I grew up watching Jeepers Creepers. He's my childhood horror icon along with Chucky. Oh, cute. Yeah, Justin Long is is one of those comfort actors to me. I think because off screen, he seems like such a like genuine cool guy. I don't know. Oh, thank you for the tip. The remake of The Hills Have Eyes is more palatable, but still not for me. The sequels of the remake was just dumb fun. Emphasis on dumb. All right. And yep, Craven did write and produce the remake and its sequel. Ugh. Okay, fine. All right. Fine. I'll watch those. Fine. Especially because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take me the next couple days, I think, to write this script. Probably going to be shooting that deep dive on Sunday, maybe? Maybe Monday. Ooh, I don't know. I'm going to Horror Nights again on Sunday, though. <sighs> yeah. So we'll see. Don't like the dog scene in the thing. That's understandable. That's a, it's a tough watch. I get that. Um, oh, you hope the Barbarian is out on media by Thanksgiving. I'm visiting a daughter, and she's fun to watch scary movies with. I hope so, too. Although I do hope that it has as long of a theatrical run as possible. I think, I think they deserve that. <clears throat> The thing is, John Carpenter's best film, I think, yeah, I think there's honestly no competition. I mean, Halloween is right there, but, like, the thing, I mean, the thing is better. It just is. Oh, Wes Craven versus John Carpenter. Who do you like more? Oh, I, mm, I think I, I think I would have to go with Craven. Just because overall in Craven's filmography, I think that there were more movies that I actually did really like. Whereas with John Carpenter, there's a lot of movies where I can understand why other people like them. I think they're fine movies, but I still didn't really like them. I think Craven has more movies I, I genuinely liked. Although we'll we'll have to see. I'll have to stack them up and and compare them. Maybe at like the end of it all, the end of this this very long director's series, maybe I can like rank all my favorite directors or something like that. I don't know. You saw my soul to take in 3D. Oh my gosh, really, really bad 3D. Yeah, because I came out in what 2010, and then the year before there was my bloody Valentine 3D, and 3D was a was a big thing in horror at the time. It was just nothing was even 3D. They just made us pay extra for the glasses. What? Oh my god, the caterpillars sound worse than the gators. Honestly, I don't like they. I don't like bugs really. I mean, I like them in a controlled environment. I like to look at them and look at their wings and stuff, but when they're flying around at me or things are dropping on me or something, like, I don't know, sometimes you're out in the woods and, like, Terminators will just, I mean, Terminators, <laughs> not Terminators, Termites, <laughs> like, Termites will just, like, fall on your head or something. That's, like, gross. That is gross. Yeah, so I think that would be where, although alligators, like, I mean, things crawling around your feet are not that much better. I don't know. I don't know. You love Halloween over the thing, but certainly understand and don't don't hate if you say the thing is the best film. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, in terms of entertainment value too, I think it's definitely a toss up with the thing in Halloween because I think I love those movies pretty equally. So entertainment value wise, that's a toss up, but the thing is is definitely a better movie, I would say. Hills asks unapologetically what we will do for family and continues Wes's themes of the em emptiness of revenge. It's rough, but passionate. And the dogs are treated like real characters. Okay. All right. That's valid. That's valid. Oh yeah. And Swamp Thing was a comic book movie. This is true. This is true. Scream 3 is the worst in the series. You are not alone, my man. You are not alone. 
Oh, Deadly Blessing has the snake. Okay. As I've never seen it. Um, only only snake to film I'll watch is snakes on a plane. <laughs> you have a pet python. Oh, cool. So you don't like film showing them as nasty. Then you probably don't like Indiana Jones, I would bet. Um, oh, do you think Wes Craven should direct, write, and be in the makings of a new American Horror Story season if he was still alive? I think that'd be really cool. I think it'd be super cool if American Horror Story brought in, like, John Carpenter or something, you know, like, these horror legends. Absolutely. You know, take the reins a little bit away from Ryan Murphy because the show has gotten very repetitive over the years. So, yeah, I would definitely say yes. I would definitely say yes to that. Um, yeah, just bring in a fresh take, for the love of God. They Because there was that show in the early 2000s called Masters of Horror, and I covered two of the episodes that, that Carpenter directed during that deep dive. So I wonder if, oh, I should check and see if Craven directed any of those episodes too, because then I should probably include that. Uh, yeah, anyway. Oh, New Light Cinema is sometimes called The House That Freddy Built. Yeah, it was the film that launched the studio's legitimacy. That makes sense. That's a good tidbit. Thank you for the fun fact. Thank you. It's hard to name Wes Craven's definitive magnum opus, but taking it by decade, it would be The Hills Have Eyes, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Scream. Absolutely. You know, that's another really cool thing I've noticed, too, is like... Also, okay, tangent. Tangent here. So... Basically, I feel like with Carpenter too, there were a lot of his movies that I was like, damn, these are really bad. And same thing with Craven. But the the way that Wes Craven completely redefined horror pretty much once a decade, you know, whether it be like the Grindhouse stuff in the 70s or, you know, because, because Last House on the Left, that preceded Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then with A Nightmare on Elm Street, which is just this crazy unique concept absolutely never been done before uh and then scream of course which was just like you know brought meta commentary to the forefront of horror and i i think it i think there's something to be said about the fact that like we got to pay our bills and so even these even these masterminds these masters of horror they are gonna have a lot of stinker movies because like they got to pay their bills too they got to make their way and so I just think it's really interesting. I think it's I think it's only natural that directors are not going to knock it out of the park every time. Because, you know, I'm a really big Jordan Peele fan, but I didn't really like Nope at all. I, I thought it was kind of weak. And I think, and now as I'm exploring the two most famous horror directors of all time, and I've watched all of their movies now, I think that just like makes sense. It just makes sense with like how creativity works, how creatives work. Um, cause even for myself now, like now, thank God I have like my patrons, I do these live streams and like, I'm making a little more with YouTube. So I have the time to like dedicate to, to rest and like fueling creativity and stuff because it just doesn't, it doesn't work when you're just trying to churn it out, you know? Um, so, but, but sometimes you have to, it's just the name of the game. Like we got to pay our bills, you know? <laughs> so that's all. I have more perspective on that now too. Cause I, you know, initially with Carpenter, I was like, why do I, why are some of these movies bad? Like that's not really, that's not really adding up. But anyway. Oh, he went broke. So agree to do Hills too. That is also true. I think, cause I think they shot the Hills have eyes too before he sold a nightmare on Elm Street, even though it came out the year after I feel, I feel like I remember him saying that in an interview, but yeah. So anyway, then after Hills of Eyes Part 2, which we, we've we already kind of chatted about, um, he did Deadly Friend, and then he was only a director, not a producer, a writer, nothing else like that. And then after that would be Dream Warriors, which he was just an executive producer on, and he helped to write it. So Dream Warriors, I really wish that I had done like a triple feature last night, but I get tired at like 10 p.m., so I didn't end up watching the third one. I think I'm going to watch that one today, and and dream master which is one of my favorites of the franchise or it was the first time around so i'm excited to rewatch both of those and i'm sure that we have a lot of fans of dream warriors in the chat today i would not doubt that um uh, yeah big loss for the studios that didn't take it yeah for real oh my gosh and and also same thing that that happened with um barbarian i think he spent over a year trying to sell Barbarian to studios and and they all said no and then you know finally finally and thank god because it's going to be I mean now it's it's the number one movie in America right now I wonder I wonder how it's going to stack up like how it'll perform 
you know, amongst all the rest of the horror movies of the year. Because this is, I mean, Scream 5 made a really big splash because it was a lot better than a lot of us expected it to be. Same thing happened with Prey. I'm just trying to think of another movie this year that, like, really stunned everybody. Because they're calling Barbarian the, um, the, the malignant of 2022, which I would say so. I think it's definitely going to be the most shocking of the year. It'll be interesting to see, like, where it stacks up with the box office and everything. But sorry, tangents. Side note, how did Horror Nights go? Oh, it's great. I love Horror Nights. You've always wanted to go. Yeah, I. it's really fun. It's just a really good time because there's just a lot of other horror people there. A lot of them get like, <laughs> a lot of people were kind of belligerently drunk when I went last time. And I was just like watching people live their best life, honestly, I think. And and I was in the, I was in the, um, I was in the, the Harry Potter bar and the group of girls in front of like me and my date were really, really drunk, but they were being so nice to the cashier. And they were like, we just really appreciate that. Like, even though you're really busy, you've been so nice to us. <laughs> They're so cute. So yeah, it's a great time. It's a really great time. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Oh, thank you for the tip. As much as I love Wes Craven, I didn't really like Swamp Thing. I didn't really either. Craven had nothing to do with it, but I love the sequel, The Return of the Swamp Thing. Okay, it's DC Comics. That, did that affect my feelings towards it? No. I, I would never say that like something being DC gives me any type of bias towards it because, I mean, like The Sandman, I went in totally blind. I knew it was a DC property, but just went in completely blind and like loved it. So I, I try not to have a bias against DC because they're capable of doing cool things and they have really cool properties. It's just been a very, a very unfortunate rollout, like since for, I don't know, the past decade, they've just been having a rough go of things, <laughs> having a real rough go of things. Um, you, you love the thing in Halloween, but you're a slasher fanboy. Yeah, so Halloween, of course, of course. Can't blame you. Um, never really connected to Justin Long. He's a good actor, though. I think he's a great actor. I think he's great. I don't know why I have such a connection. I feel like he was Maybe it's because he was in a couple, like, early 2000s comedies. Maybe that's why. And, like, you know, I was a kid in the early 2000s, so that might be why. I'm not sure. Um, and so, let's see. Okay, so what was after... Let's see. I don't know if anybody commented about Dream Warriors yet, but after, after Dream Warriors was Serpent in the Rainbow and then Shocker. So those were his last two of the 80s. Serpent in the Rainbow, I, I don't know. I've heard a lot of people praise that one. It was a really interesting concept, but I, it just wasn't for me. Like, I was not into it at all. And then Shocker was just one of the weirdest movies I'd ever seen. It was one of the most balls-to-the-wall, insane, mind-fuckery type movies ever. Like, I... I don't even know how to explain Shocker. And I think it was actually a pretty good concept, but coming out the other side, like it had me hooked and stuff and I was really interested in the movie, but coming out the other side, I don't even know if I could really tell you what it's about. Like, I don't, it's just such a trip. It's an absolute trip. I guess I could kind of say the same for The Serpent and the Rainbow and it's got, it's got some good horror moments in it, but I don't know. Sometimes some of the psychedelic vibes were were like a little too much and it just it was a little messy. It was a little messy, but yeah. Oh yeah, the best thing about Last House. Yeah, I I wanted to mention this. It also launched Sean Cunningham, which is really interesting. Gave us both Nightmare and Friday the 13th. This is true. This is very true. Um which I feel like I don't know, maybe not a lot of people know about that, but uh yeah, Sean Cumming Cunningham kind of took Craven under his wing. In fact, in the years when he went broke, when he was trying to sell A Nightmare on Elm Street, he had to borrow money from Sean Cunningham to pay his taxes, which is just really something. It's just, that's just quite a little tidbit right there. Love Scream 3. Me too. Yeah, there's no bad Scream movie, in my opinion. Um, but you, but you don't like Scream 4. I would very much disagree. Um, let's see. Oh, Dream Warriors, here we go, is way better than the original purely as a film, but the original followed and built the template so well. But Dream Warriors has better characters and story. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to get to the bottom of that on my rewatch today. Yeah, because I don't know, I don't remember loving the characters of Dream Warriors. I, the first time I saw it, I felt like it was a little bit overhyped. <laughs> but this time, I don't know, because I loved the first sequel so much more when I watched it last night compared to my, my first viewing of it. So, 
maybe yeah maybe i'll like dream warriors more too in fact i i think i definitely will i think i definitely will yeah dream master is so underrated oh my god I used to like Dream Warriors more. I think for me, the main thing with Dream Master is like, I love the characters. I love Alice and the practical effects. I think they're some of the best of the franchise. There's even like, I think it's like a 45 minute long documentary on the making of um, Dream Dream uh, Master. And they they show you like how they do everything. And it's it's insane. I just bumped my desk. Sorry. It's, it's nuts. And it's free to watch on YouTube. I would definitely watch that documentary if you haven't before. Um, didn't Disney put together the Barbarian trailer? Yeah, Disney. I think Disney distributed Barbarian, which is just so weird. I believe it's a Disney production somehow. I heard that in an interview. I, yeah, I don't know what studio funded it, but it was distributed by Disney. I don't know. I'm gonna have to, I should have looked into that for my review, but I was a little bit more caught up on like, you know, the director's interviews and stuff. But yeah, I'll get to the bottom of that as well. Your best friend loved Deadly Friend, but I didn't really get it. I honestly I couldn't really pay attention to that one. That one was tough. <clears throat> oh, did I do the, the weekend maze at Horror Nights? No, we got there. We were part of the early crowd at six o'clock. It doesn't technically open until eight. And even from then, the line was 180 minutes. It was three hours long. So like, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, oh, for you, the Black Phone X and Fresh Top Barbarian. Oh, Fresh was amazing. Black Phone is okay. X is okay. Fresh was also great. Fresh was great. Oh, am I going to add Pulse? Right, yeah. He wrote the screenplay and oh, Music of the Heart. No, we're, we're getting the Music of the Heart. That was the 90s. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Pulse, let's see. Did he produce that one too? No, he only he only wrote that one. So will I include Pulse? I'll I'll watch it. Listen, I'll watch it and then I'll make up my mind. I guess I can't I guess I can't continue my Nightmare on Elm Street franchise binge today. Maybe I can. Maybe I can. I'll watch one nightmare movie and then I'll watch Pulse and then tomorrow Nightmare and then Hills Have Eyes or something. I don't know. Check out Accepted. Oh, okay. I don't know if I've heard about this one. Um Accepted with Justin Long. Uh, 2006. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Early 2000s and Jonah Hill. <gasps> oh, that was already on my watch list. What? Why haven't I watched it yet? Anyway. Oh, I heard the black phone was bad. It had a very spoiler filled trailer. Like the trailer is the movie. There's not, not much else to it. Um, I didn't think it was bad. I thought it was really entertaining, but it's, it's only okay. It's not doing anything super new really. Thank you for the tip. You have no bias. I call your bluff. Marvel's version of Swamp Thing. The Man Thing has its own horror movie too called Man Thing. Balls in your coin. <laughs> um, I don't know. Because like, I feel like Marvel has made its fair share of missteps too. So, you know. But they just have happened to be on a really good roll lately. Well, no. Actually, Phase 4 has been my least favorite phase of, you know, like since they started these, these live action, you know, movies in 2008. So, I don't know. But yeah, read me, you know, you might be right. Yeah, everyone was disappointed by Nightmare on Elm Street 2 on release. There were loads of jokes about the swimming pool scene. It was, uh, oh, right, and Dream, Dream Warriors was seen as a return to form. That makes more sense. I think that makes a little bit more sense. That gives me some context as to, like, yeah. And then also, you know, another thing, too, that I noticed about the first sequel was, like, the, the, if the sexuality themes are so over the top and in your face, but at the time when the movie was released, because of, like, societal norms of the time, people did not pick up on the subtext. And, like, it's just so weird because, like, it jumps out to you now. But just, like, weird how, like, weird how, like, blind you, we, we were back then, you know? Anyway, another tangent. You love the Dream Warriors, but the original is brilliant. I love the concept of New Nightmare. I've heard rumors about them doing another nightmare with Heather and Nancy's son Dylan continuing that story. There is a fan film, I think, um, that, that Vinny is actually involved in. Uh, Dylan, I think it's called Dylan's New Nightmare, uh, that I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't know if they got the original actor to come back, uh, but yeah, that's the thing that's happening, at least as a fan film. I don't know if they're going to do another studio film, though. You grew up watching Justin Long, nice. Oh, yeah, in New Girl. 
Right. I love New Girl. Oh my gosh. It's one of the best sitcoms ever. Going the distance, waiting. He's just fun to watch. He's just, he's very talented. He's so funny too. He's so funny in Barbarian. Oh my gosh. Um, oh, thank you for the tip. I love Elm Street 3, but I can't look at it exactly the same after seeing snippets of the script that almost was in the Never Sleep Again documentary. If you thought it was dark before, oh, so it was like even more fucked up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't know how, I don't think I'm going to be doing too much research into the A Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, for especially not for my Craven video and for when I do the re-ranking coming up, which, oh, by the way, on that note, a couple things, a couple things, uh, I don't have, I don't have dates locked in yet, so I can't tell you to mark your calendars, but this is kicking off like a bunch of Wes Craven content, and so coming up next, we have um, my Wes Craven deep dive video. I think I'm going to be doing that next before I go live again. And then I don't know what's going to come next. I think I'm going to do, um, my, my dad watches A Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time. And we have a spoiler filled talk about that. And then I'm also going to do ranking the entire franchise on a live stream. And then I might conclude this Wes Craven week by doing my Nightmare on Elm Street original versus remake comparison. So I'm not totally sure in the order of that. Might also kind of feel it out with what you guys want to see and when. Um, but yeah, so I think that's that's the current mode of attack. Up next will be the video deep dive. Um, then going to uh, do my dad watches A Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time, ranking the franchise, and then concluding with that comparison. I think that'll be a good way to go. And then we'll move on to some child's play content, which I am very excited about. And then Halloween content, because then it'll be October. And oh my God, so much coming up. So much coming up. Oh, he plays a hilarious stoner in Strange Wilderness. I don't think that one's on my watch list, actually. So let me let me just go ahead. <laughs> Strange Wilderness. Yeah, he's just a funny dude. 2008. I will eat this up. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. Oh, Justin's here. Good to have you. Yeah, I know. He goes to a leather bar. Not exactly subtle. It's not subtle at all. But then, but yeah, I don't know. At the time, just you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really picked up on that way, which is, which is interesting. I mean, I guess, well, the screenwriter probably was not out at the time, but yeah, the screenwriter, the lead star, both gay. I mean, come on, come on now. Um, I saw this really, I saw this really weird satirical review. Um, this person was having to defend themselves a lot in the comments of their review because like people weren't getting it with satire. I couldn't tell it was satire either, but just basically went on like this tirade about how the movie was like so anti-homosexuality and everything and how Freddie possessing Jesse was like uh, a metaphor for him coming out and how it, it, his homosexuality was a monster he was keeping inside of him. It's like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, relax, whoa, relax. Um, if anything, I would say it would represent more like more like queer guilt because it came out at the time of like the AIDS epidemic and everything. But anyway, that's another tangent. They did get the original Dylan to come back. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I can't wait for that one now. I, I feel like I'm I'm having more love for A Nightmare on Elm Street now as the time goes on and like as I'm doing my rewatches. And it's funny because initially this it wasn't really the franchise for me. We'll see, we'll see how I do, especially with like once we get to the latter half of the franchise, I think the first the first half is way better than the last half. And I know that the last half does include New Nightmare. I wasn't crazy about it when I watched it, but again, like because I'll be on my rewatch and I'll have more knowledge of the franchise this go-around, maybe I'll like it more. But yeah, five, six, and the remake. Mm. There are things that I do like about the remake, I can't lie. I can't lie, but I know it's bad. So yeah, the first four movies, I think I'm, you know, I'm having a good time with. You rewatched, ah, speaking of, you, you rewatched the remake for the first time in 10 years recently and it's honestly not that bad. Yeah, Jackie Earl Haley, Jackie Earl Haley, excuse me, is, is incredible as Freddy, I think. And even the man himself, Robert England was like, yeah, the torch was well passed. But there's just unfortunately a lot of other stuff about the movie that's bad. But also like the style. I think the style and the direction is honestly pretty good. So you recommend the documentary Scream Queen on Shudder. Oh, right. Yeah, I I meant to watch that like forever ago. And I just forgot about its, its existence. But I think that was also before I had Letterboxd. So like I didn't have a good, 
I didn't have a good watch list going. Let me, let's see if it's on here. Scream Queen. Let's see. Is this, oh no, that's not the right one. 2003 perhaps? No. no. Oh, oh, yep. There it is from 2019. Found it. Found it. Okay. That one is on the watch list now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ryan's coming through with the facts today. Um, oh yeah, Miko Hughes is coming back. Right, it's Miko Hughes, right, from Pet Cemetery. Oh my gosh. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, he was also also Gage in Pet Cemetery. Yep, yep. Um, oh, you're reading some some spooky stuff for spooky season. Will I have any book content for us? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've considered doing like a ranking video of all the Stephen King books that I've read. I just don't know. I don't know how well that would do, how well book content would do on my channel. So I feel like I would have to relate it to the movies as well. So I might do like a ranking of, uh, you know, Stephen, ad Stephen King adaptations that I've actually read, you know, which would be like The Shining and Misery and It and... Um, The Outsider, Dr. Sleep. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I guess that would be fun because then I could relate it to the movies and talk about that a bit more. So maybe I'll do that. But yeah, I, that won't be anytime soon because I have kind of an overload of stuff scheduled for October that I don't even think I'm going to get to any of it because I'm also going to be, I mean, I don't think I'm going to get to all of it. I'm going to try to get to as much of it as I can, but I'll also be traveling and stuff. So yeah, I don't think I can add, add any book content. Although for my it comparison, which will be coming sometime in October, um, I'm thinking probably closer to Halloween is when it's going to come out, but that I will be doing like comparisons to the book in my it comparison. So that's a little bit of book content for you. Do I plan on doing a live stream over the weekend? I do. I do. I think that this weekend is going to be the weekend where I make my dad watch A Nightmare on Elm Street and then we have our spoiler discussion for it. So yeah, if you guys don't have your watch list for the weekend set yet, then yeah, throw on A Nightmare on Elm Street tonight or tomorrow. Although last night on my on my horror Instagram, I did put on my story. I was like, I said, who's with me? Because I, I posted that I was watching A Nightmare on Elm Street. So I don't know. I hope that at least a couple of you guys did end up watching it with me last night. I just, I like when, when my audience watches stuff with me, I got to plug in my computer. I don't know why I do this every time. Ugh. Okay. It's just, I feel weird, like leaving it plugged in, I think when it's working so hard, because I feel like that'll overheat the battery more, but also like, what do I know? You know? Um, oh yeah. It doesn't long com comes back for yoga hosiers, right? With Kevin Smith. Right. Yeah. Oh, Dream Warriors might be your least favorite of the first five movies. Uh, for first five movies, hot take, hot take. It's not as creepy as the first movies, but not as goofy as the later ones either. That's actually a fair point. It's actually a fair point. Um, <laughs> the scene where Jesse kisses the girl and he gets sick and his tongue transforms was such a great scene for me as a gay man. Exactly how I always felt. <laughs> You're like, yeah, girls are gross. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's, it is a really good scene. Like, honestly, I feel like if it hadn't been attached to A Nightmare on Elm Street and it was maybe a different entity rather than Freddy Krueger, I feel like the movie would have, would have done better. I don't know. I don't know. Interesting thing to ponder. You watched the original Nightmare when you were eight? Oh my gosh. But should, you, but, um, your mom wouldn't watch and gave you a giant teddy bear instead. Nice. Um... I, you were 14 years old watching it at Run Elm Street 2. I reckon they didn't pick up on the gay stuff. Adults probably did, which is where all the jokes about it came from. Fair. Thank you for the tip. The whole Nancy's son, Nancy Returns thing was one of many, much, one of many, much better scripts New Line shot down for Freddy vs. Jason. Oh, interesting. Huh. I didn't know about that. Um, did Chris say he hasn't watched Pet Cemetery? It's, oh, a must read. I haven't read it either, but I really want to. It's a really short book. Same thing with Carrie. Maybe I should try to, I should try to read those this year. After I finish it, perhaps, perhaps. I don't know. I have books on my nightstand. I have, I have so many books <laughs> I need to read. I just don't have the time. Um, yes, that Nightmare on Elm Street documentary, Scream Queen was so good to watch. Yeah, good stuff. Shudder has the best documentaries, the best docuseries. You guys should also watch 101 of the best horror movie moments in history or something that it's called. I think they've only released the first episode. The second one might be out now. I don't know. But yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on that. I'm gonna get on that. 
Oh, the teaser for Don't Worry Darling looks kind of good. Okay. You saw the ad on one of my videos. Hey, I love that. It makes me so happy, honestly, that like teasers and stuff and, and shutter ads play before my videos because I'm like, you get it. You get it and you want to be here. That makes me happy. Uh, oh, you're on watching the Tommy Knockers. I've never seen it or read the book or read the book. Uh, when am I going to do a live watch along on Twitch? The Twitch stream where you did your child's play comparison research was fun. I know it's just like Twitch is, it's just like one of those things where it's a whole other thing. I've been trying also to like, you know, put a lot of energy into my Patreon and stuff um, for my paying members. So yeah, it's just, it's just a whole other thing, but I feel like I have a really good rhythm down with Patreon now. Um, and I've kind of figured out that content. So maybe I can get back to Twitch. I think that I am going to do that for sure when I go to the UK because my friends there, they also used to stream on Twitch all the time. So I think that they would love to do that with me. And it'd be really fun because we would be there just watching horror movies, drinking, whatever. And then, you know, feel like we're all just kind of hanging out. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully come October, I'll be doing some, some live watch alongs. Gotta go. No worries. Have a good day. Have a good day. Took you a while to warm up to Nightmare on Elm Street. Me too, honestly. However, the ones in the franchise I watch for is Nancy. You watch for Nancy and Jason. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, oh, The Carpenters, The Thing is coming back to theaters again. Wow. I saw it in theaters earlier this year. I think back in like June. Yeah, that was great. And I just saw Jaws in theaters for the first time. That was awesome. Okay, let's see. Where were we? Where were we? Because we <laughs> we stopped after the people under the stairs. So let me just rattle off everything he did in the 90s because I feel like we're going to run out of time. Um, so we have the people under the stairs in 1991. Then we got Wes Craven's New Nightmare in 94, which is kind of like the spiritual precursor to Scream, I would say, with like the meta aspect of it. Then we got Vampire in Brooklyn. Um, odd choice, but Angela Bassett made it really worth the watch, and it was it was entertaining, I thought. Then we got Scream, and then Scream 2 the very next year. And then Music of the Heart in 1999, which was a weird movie, in my opinion. Music of the Heart. Meryl Streep's character was not likable at all. And there was kind of this running thing where it's like her students enjoyed that she wasn't a nice teacher because she was really harsh with her criticisms of like teaching these young kids violin. But I don't know. It's just, it's at first I was like, oh my God, like total white savior vibes. And then there was this, then there was like a black mom character in the show. And she was like, I've seen like white ladies like you that come in and you think you, you try to save like our kids that don't need saving whatever. And I was like, oh, okay. So it's like self-aware in that way at least. But then there's another scene later on where Meryl Streep is like telling the same mom, you really shouldn't keep your kid out of my class because if you really knew how much joy, like playing the violin, you know, gave him whatever, blah, blah, blah. Basically just like proving her wrong. I was like, well, okay, we kind of walked back on that, didn't we, a bit. And she's just not a likable character. Like it's it's a weird, it's a weird movie. I didn't have a good time with it. And it's so long. Oh my God. And it's kind of like one of those Oscar bait type movies. I don't know if any of you guys like it, but I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it. Um, obviously, in my opinion, the best work of the 90s from him is Scream and Scream 2. But yeah, let me let, let me know how you feel about, about any of those movies as well, especially like Vampire in Brooklyn or Music of the Heart. Um, because I know I'm sure plenty of us have talked about New Nightmare before uh, in, in a chat, perhaps, or maybe on one of my old videos. But yeah, I don't know. Vampire in Brooklyn, I understand why it was not a hit. And Music of the Heart, I don't even know if it was or not. I think it's, it's, well, actually, let me, let me check its score, because I feel like it has, like, a decent rating, but it, what, nothing great. Um, Music of the Heart. Has it, oh, it has a 63% on Rotten Tomatoes. Okay, I'm not alone then. <laughs> All right, that makes sense. I'm not alone then. Um, Let's see. Oh, you're going to you're going to read Carrie soon for your horror group. Oh, you have a horror group book club. That's fun. I wish that I had that. Oh, you should also tackle the Leprechaun movies. I was going to earlier this year, but then yeah, I just went through some tough family stuff. So, yeah, hopefully this next year I can do a ranking of the franchise for St. Patrick's Day. I think I'll do that. Um, yeah, you watched the first episode of 101 Things. Yeah, you were sucked in the entire time. It was a great first episode. It was great. I'm excited for, I'm excited for that. Um, please no Twitch. I'm such a boomer. Please don't make this more confusing for us old millennials. Um, yeah, I mean, 
it's just the same as how I stream here, but I also just, I don't know. I gotta, I gotta play to the audiences of each platform. I don't feel like my audience on YouTube would be that interested in a watch along. And also there's also the matter of like the sound potentially getting picked up and I don't want to get like a copyright claim or something like that on Twitch. It's Twitch feels a little bit more safe to do stuff like that. And obviously like I wouldn't be showing the movie on the screen or anything and we'd be adding our commentary. So it's technically fair use, but sometimes like copyright owners will still claim things. Then YouTube usually takes the side of the copyright owner. So just don't really want to risk that on YouTube. I'm sorry. I don't trust me. Also, I don't want to have to like be on all these different platforms, like managing all these different accounts, but it's kind of just the nature of like how we got to do things as content creators, you know? Love your live streams. Be fun at the end to suggest or challenge us to watch a favorite horror movie to watch or rewatch. Good idea. Good idea. I would say, okay, so my call to action for this live stream would definitely be to watch any Wes Craven movie that you haven't seen before that has maybe piqued your interest. I, for me, like if you, the number one that I would recommend um, about everything else, like, you know, Night Run Elm Street and Scream would definitely be, I think, <sighs> either The People Under the Stairs or Cursed. And it's going to depend entirely on what you're looking for. The People Under the Stairs has really interesting, well-fleshed-out commentary, um, really great little final boy, great characters, um, a lot of unhinged moments. Then you can say the same thing for Cursed, which is more of a really cheesy, early 2000s, kind of star-studded cast uh, that's just a really insane, goofy, fun time. So it's kind of depending on what you're looking for. I personally think I enjoyed Cursed more than the more than the people under the stairs. Those would be the two that I would challenge you guys to watch, probably above anything else. And then I don't know, Red Eye is also kind of up there because that is a good cast as well, and it's it's pretty well done. So yeah, that'll be my call to action for this stream. I would say. Um, and then you think Scream Two and New Nightmare are pretty neck and neck? Okay, which is better? Both have qualities the other could use. Interesting. I didn't think about that. Scream 2 is your top 10 favorite horror films of all time and your favorite Scream film too. Interesting. I've, I've heard people say that though. People, A lot of people have a real soft spot for Scream 2, which I get it. It's like one of the best sequels ever made. Um, I figured you'd let everyone know your beautiful dog Xena is here chilling with us. Uh, she's also a fan of these live streams and is here often. Uh, that's very sweet. That's very sweet. I feel like I, yeah, I wish that I had, like, a little buddy. I, I want a cat so bad to, like, watch YouTube videos with me and stuff. So I'm happy you get to do that. Gotta make a Twitch account now. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I'm I'm sorry about that as well. I hope you know. Um, but, okay, so let's, let's, let's just rattle off the rest of the filmography because I'm gonna have to sign off kind of soon here because <laughs> I'm gonna lose my voice. But, yeah, it doesn't seem like many of you guys in the chat have seen Music of the Heart. I haven't really gotten any comments on it. So that's kind of what I expected. I feel like that movie has kind of faded into obscurity, even though it stars Meryl Streep. Like it's a Meryl Streep Oscar bait type film, but it's just honestly not great. So anyway, so then we hit the 2000s, baby. So in 2000, of course, we got Scream 3. I've already talked a lot about Cursed, which was 2005. Red Eye was also 2005. And then Pulse and Paris Jetame, they were both 2006. The Hills Have Eyes 2 is the only one on here. Did he? I mean, he was involved with the first remake too. I don't know why it's not listed here. So then there was The Hills of Eyes, The Hills of Eyes 2 in 2007, My Soul to Take in 2010, and Scream 4 was his final film in 2011. So for me, I don't know. I guess oh, I can't really speak to like Pulse in Paris and The Hills Have Eyes. So I'm just going to be talking about yeah, Scream 3, Cursed, Red Eye, My Soul to Take, Scream 4. I think there is a little bit of a contrast with Craven versus Carpenter where I do feel like Craven maintained a little bit more of the the quality, I think, of his films later on. And obviously Scream was like his baby, so there, there was so much... There was so much, like, love and energy spent on Scream, so those were going to be great. But then also, like, with Cursed, Red Eye, My Soul to Take... Okay, my soul to take was not great, but still very interesting and unique. Um, I think, I don't know. I don't feel like he really, he really took his foot off the gas, you know, even towards the end. And I also, I guess that like, I didn't know any of the details of his passing really either, but 
apparently he had been really sick for a long time and he didn't really tell anybody. So that was kind of a sad thing to see. I watched, um, oh, there's a really loud truck outside my window. I hope you don't hear that. Um, Anyway, I watched this this Larry King interview, and it was like a retrospective interview when he passed. So Skeet Ulrich was there. Um, who else was on that interview? Oh, Robert England was there. Uh, Jamie Kennedy. And well, why did I bring this up? I've lost my train of thought. Why did I bring that up? I'm going to have to go to the chat. Hopefully it'll come back to me. My word. My word. Your horror group does a lot of virtual watch por- parties. Yeah, Discord is Discord is handy for that. It's really handy for that. Um, but we have to manually play the movies ourselves and hope we get them started on time. Yeah, see, that's that's a whole other thing. Is like, Discord is its is its own beast. I don't know when I would venture into that territory. I would have to wait until I can afford to have like a manager or something, because it just it gets to a point where it's like it's too much. I can't. I'm you know I'm already managing a lot as it is. I know Discord is is really handy for that, though. So, anyway. You really enjoyed Curse, too? Oh, good. Oh, good. I wish we could all see the different versions of that. Me, too. Me, too. When Judy Greer flips off Christina Ritchie. <laughs> yeah. The, great performances, too, in that movie. Um, Oh, I know. The Leprechaun, yeah. I made it through one and a half of those movies. They're very bad. I, I know. But, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for the tip. I showed my brother Elm Street too when he was about seven or eight and even asked before um, the you want to sleep with me scene, he turns to me and asks, so is he gay? <laughs> I explained and he said, really? How did they not know? Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I guess, I mean, listen, kids are more aware these days, so that's good though. Honestly, I'm glad that he was aware of that. <laughs> Oh, the Child's Play Trilogy is out on 4K Blu-ray. Do I plan on buying them? No, I already own the original first three films, so I'm not really going to prioritize upgrading those quite yet. Never even heard of Music of the Heart. See, that's what I'm saying. It's faded into obscurity. Scream and Scream 4 are so close to the heart. I know you'll definitely see their influence in the slasher movie. You will. You will. Go go follow the Instagram account right now. Some of the, some of the marketing and stuff that Francisco's posted... You'll see. There's there's some Halloween, some Scream influence. Music of the Heart is now on my watch list. I mean, I don't really recommend it, but go for it. You know, it's not it's not horrible. Oh, Cursed for some reason reminds me of the Lost Boys a little bit, but for werewolves instead of vampires, that's kind of a fair comparison, I would say. Um, Anthony's back. Glad to see it. Glad to see it. Um. Yeah, it, it was basically teenagers watching A Nightmare on Elm Street 2. I suspect they hadn't been exposed to gay stuff. But as mentioned, there were loads of jokes about it coming from adults. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, Kylie needs a staff. Honestly, I it would be great because then I could just focus on making stuff. You know, it'd be great. But we're not we're not quite there yet. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Does Wes Craven have anything to do with Jason Goes to Hell with Freddy's glove showing up at the end scene? I honestly don't know. That's something I'll have to look into. I do not know. Um, But at that point, I mean, because that was, when was that, 2003 or something? Freddy vs. Jason? I can't remember. 2003, 2005. I don't know, because Wes Craven really had, like, no involvement with a franchise beyond New Nightmare and didn't have involvement with most of the sequels. Um, and then with the remake, he was interviewed that in, it was one of the last interviews he ever did in 2011, I think before, before he passed. And, um, he talked about how he had no involvement with the remake and that was like totally out of his control. So that was like within the same decade as Freddy vs. Jason. So I would imagine he probably didn't have any involvement in that, but I also don't know. I also don't know. Um... Oh, thank you for the tip. I saw Music of the Heart. I get that Craven wanted to expand beyond horror. I'm just not too into biographical drama. Me either. Depends on the subject. Wasn't for me. Yeah, he um he did get kind of locked into horror, but throughout the interviews, it never it never seems like he made complaints about that. He seemed to he seemed to always enjoy what he did. Um, and Oh, also too, one thing I learned about him is like he made his first film really with students when he was a professor in college and they came to him and told him that they wanted to make 
a film club. And so he kind of helped produce a couple of short films and stuff back then. That's how he got started. And then uh, I guess it was a year or two after that, there, one of his advisors, like they came to him because he was technically kind of studying for a PhD, like during, during his pro professorial work and stuff. And uh, the, the, he, he came to him and he was like, you need to start taking this seriously. Like you haven't done any of the research for your PhD or whatever. You haven't like started writing your thesis, whatever. And so then Wes Craven just quit. He, he quit teaching and he was like, I, I need to make movies. So that's a fun story too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I'll, I'll look more into it too and see how he felt about kind of getting, if he felt trapped in horror or if that was really his true passion. I don't know. Cause I honestly don't know, but yeah, I think that's, that's about going to do it for today. Honestly, I mean, we've been over kind of the last remnants of his career. It kind of seems like a lot of you guys haven't really seen the more obscure Wes Craven movies, but, you know, I'll try to, I'll, I'll get a little bit more detailed during my deep dive and, you know, with my recommendations, which ones you guys should, should absolutely prioritize seeing. And, you know, cause I don't really recommend being a Wes Craven completionist. I think, I think some of the movies are bad enough to be considered probably a waste of your time or just not a good time to watch. So. Yeah, I'll get more into my recommendations, I think, with that deep dive. And yeah, I think that'll probably do it for today. Been live almost two hours. It's definitely time for me to eat my lunch, uh, I'll say. So um, any any last thoughts you want to drop in the chat, go ahead. But I am about to about to sign off. Um, yeah, okay. So Freddy vs. Jason was 2003. Yeah, okay. I mean, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. It was within the, it was within the same time frame that Wes was he was removed from the franchise and the rights and everything. So. Jason Goes to Hell was released in, oh, in 93. Right. Okay. And Freddy vs. Jason in 2003. Right. 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 Okay. So let's see. In 93. Oh, because New Nightmare was 94. I wonder if he was. I don't know. Huh. I I'm going to have to look into that now. Now. I don't know. I forgot. I forgot that. I forgot. There was a, there was a 10 year jump there. And then what Jason X was like, what, 2001 or something? Yeah, there was quite a jump. I don't know why I I felt like I, I, just, I didn't remember that Jason Goes to Hell was before New Nightmare. Interesting. He did, he he seemed like such a smart cool guy. Yeah, another thing too in interviews is like interviewers would would ask him too and make comments about how he was so such a relaxed cool guy and Wes Craven would be like, "Yeah, you know, my entire career basically has been people meeting me and then telling me they're surprised that I'm not a total freak weirdo. And it makes me wonder if the same thing happened to John Carpenter. I think luckily now, because there's a much bigger horror audience and it's not just like grindhouse and 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 really shocking audiences and, and upsetting people, now horror is, you know, such a more much more expansive genre. So I think now horror directors are a lot more humanized and stuff, but I bet I bet that, you know, Toby Hooper, John Carpenter, they I bet they went through the same things. Wes Craven just talked about it a little bit more. <laughs> anyway. Oh, thank you for the tip. So we've been talking about Cursed and somebody commented that they have a dog named Xena. I know he's kind of fallen out of favor with the fans, but Kevin Sorbo's Hercules appears in Cursed as one of the wax figures. Oh, I didn't even, I wouldn't know that. That is a crazy fun fact. I feel that is, how do you even, how, how do you even know these things? That's just, it's so specific. <laughs> but yeah, I think Xena is such a cute name for a dog. Anyway, um, oh, you'll watch people under the stairs after this. Oh, good, good. Good, I'm glad to hear that. <clears throat> Um, okay. I think I will leave you folks here. I hope that you enjoyed today's live stream. Thank you guys for coming and, you know, sticking with me through all the tangents and everything, as we know, that does often happen on these live streams and me losing my train of thought. I lost one earlier that I, I guess it never really came back to me. I don't know. Hopefully I kind of circle back to it at some point, but who knows? Who knows? Um, I hope that you enjoyed. Have a good, happy, safe day or night, wherever you are. Um, pick a Wes Craven movie. Give it a watch or watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Give it a rewatch if you haven't in a while. And I hope to see you this weekend while we make my dad watch a Nightmare on Elm Street. I don't think he's going to like it, you guys, but I'm interested to see all of his thoughts on the movie and having that spoiler chat. So I will see you then. Bye.